Hello everyone and welcome to this late conclusive presentation to our Geology of Scotland online course. The course has run over the last six weeks as part of the Festival of Geology organized by the Scottish Geology Trust. The aim of the course has been to provide a glimpse into the very old and rich geology of Scotland and into the formation and deposition of its major rock units. The structure of the course followed the geological structure of Scotland in that our introductory session was followed by five others, where each of them had a central theme, one of Scotland's five terrains. However, my feeling was that with the end of the last session, the course ended rather abruptly with no major conclusions drawn. So I thought about making this extra presentation, which, although it will not be as long as the others, will try to bring together the major key points we've discussed so far. Scotland is made of five terrains, or fragments of continental crust, which we see on this map. Some of these formed very early in the history of planet Earth. Others formed more recently, but each of them witnessed unique geological events and as a result has a unique sequence of rocks. These terrains assembled to form Scotland in decreasing order of their age, with the oldest terrain located in the far northwest and the youngest in the southeast. For most of its existence, Scotland was part of the long-lived continent of Laurentia that represents the ancient core of nowadays North America, but also included Greenland, Scotland and part of Ireland. Throughout geologic time, continental masses moved around driven by the amazing force of plate tectonics and sometimes merged together to form supercontinents. Scotland was part of four supercontinents, Columbia, Rodinia, Panotia, which was very short-lived, and finally Pangaea. Now let's have a very quick look at the rocks and start with the Hebridean terrain, which is a terrain of geological contrasts, where the oldest and youngest rocks of Scotland meet. The oldest rocks are collectively known as the Louisian complex or the Louisian gneiss complex, because the most prevalent type of rock is gneiss, a rock that formed following multiple episodes of burial, heating, melting and deformation. And all these processes were caused by multiple orogenic events related to the existence of the supercontinent Columbia. Throughout most of the terrain, and most notably in the Outer Hebrides, the Louisian complex outcrops at the surface of the Earth and is not buried under more recent rocks. In part of the mainland, however, on top of the Louisian complex lies another magnificent rock unit, and that is the Toridonian supergroup. These rocks are considerably younger than the Louisian complex. They are mostly sandstones and represent solidified sediments that resulted from the erosion of various sources across Laurentia. These sandstones were intensely eroded to the point they now appear mostly as isolated mountains that rise dramatically above the Louisian basement. The following two groups of rocks represent the early Paleozoic deposits that were laid down on top of the Toridonian sandstones in a shallow marine environment with powerful tidal currents reflected in the cross bedding of the lower units. The most recent rocks are the lava fields and central complexes of the Hebridean Igneous Province, a fragment of the more extensive North Atlantic Igneous Province that formed with the opening of the North Atlantic Ocean. The lava fields are the result of huge lava floods and were followed by the actual formation of volcanic edifices with associated magmatic intrusions. If we look at the geologic timescale, 
we notice three major gaps in time between the deposition of the four major units of the Hebridean terrain. These gaps in which mostly erosion but no deposition occurs are called unconformities and are very often encountered within the rock record. The oldest rocks in the Northern Highlands terrain are represented by outcrops and inliers of the Louisian complex, and also very similar basement rocks up to 3,000 million years old. The extent of these rocks in the Northern Highlands is much more limited than in the Hebridean terrain. The next major rock unit is the Moin supergroup that covers most of the terrain and consists of four groups of rocks. It was deposited as sediments derived from the erosion of an impressive mountain chain, the Grand Ville, that formed as the supercontinent Rodinia assembled. The sediments consolidated in time and were later severely deformed during the formation of another impressive mountain chain, the Caledonian. The older sandstone occupies most of the northeastern part of the terrain and was deposited in a major sedimentary basin, the Orcadian, that was located approximately where the Murray Firth is located now. As the name suggests, the rocks are mostly sandstones and the original sediments came from the erosion of the Caledonian Mountains. Some of the lava fields and central complexes of the Hebridean Igneous province are encountered on the Isle of Mull, its neighboring islets, and the adjacent mainland. Let's move on to the next terrain, which is the Grampian. The oldest rocks here are younger than the oldest rocks of the previous terrains. So this terrain is also younger than the other two. And there are two kinds of basement rocks here. The older of them, the rings complex, outcrops only on a very small area on two of the inner Hebrides. The younger of the basement rocks is the Badenoch group that outcrops on a larger area in the mainland. It consists mostly of migmatites, a special rock that has been partially melted after being metamorphosed. There is a difference in age of about 1,000 million years between the Rings complex and the Badenoch group. The Badenoch group is overlain by rocks of the Dalradian supergroup, which is the largest rock unit in the terrain and similar to the Moin supergroup of the Northern Highlands, also contains four groups of rocks that were strongly deformed during the Caledonian orogeny. We briefly reviewed these groups in the session dedicated to the Grampian terrain, and we've seen that among the mostly marine sediments, glacial sediments called tillites are also encountered. These formed during the severe glaciations that mark the end of the Precambrian. The old red sandstone is also present here, and as we can see, was mostly deposited in the Orcadian Basin, but an isolated outcrop occurs in the southwest around Argyle. And this is the last terrain where we encounter remnants of the Hebridean Igneous province, and we are talking about the central complex on the Isle of Arran. The Midland Valley terrain is the oldest of the two more recent accretionary terrains of Scotland. It is believed to be underlain by one or several volcanic arcs that collided with the Laurentian margin around 470 million years ago. This was the first of a series of three major collisions that defined the Caledonian orogeny. The oldest rocks of the Midland Valley 
are represented by the Ballantrae ophiolite complex that consists of a now heavily dismembered section through the Earth's oceanic lithosphere, which includes parts of the upper mantle, the oceanic crust, and the sedimentary cover. The complex was formed as a portion or several portions of the subducting oceanic plate of the Iapetus Ocean, instead of sinking, were emplaced onto the continental margin of Laurentia. The Ballantrae complex is covered by a local sequence of early Paleozoic sedimentary rocks that were originally deposited in a marine environment. Similar rocks appear as inliers along the southern margin of the terrain. These rocks are followed by the Old Red Sandstone that was laid down in two separate basins along the northern and southern margins of the terrain. At that time, these two basins were divided by a range of active volcanoes which also provided lavas and pyroclastic material that now appear interspersed with a majority of the sedimentary rocks that are sandstones. Several rock groups were deposited next. These make the late Paleozoic deposits that were laid down in different depositional environments that reflect a cyclic climate change from hot and dry conditions to hot and humid, and then back to a hot and dry climate. The first and last of the deposits are sandstones that largely resemble the old red sandstone that was deposited previously. Coal was formed in abundance in the hot and humid climate. Finally, the southern uplands terrain is also an accretionary terrain, the youngest addition to the oldest parts of Scotland. With the accretion of the southern uplands, Scotland became finally assembled, and about at the same time, the British Isles acquired their present configuration as well. As an accretionary prison, the southern uplands consists of a succession of oceanic crust and overlying sediments that were scraped off the descending oceanic plate and accredited onto the overlying continental plate. Unlike the Ballantrae complex of the Midland Valley, the succession here does not include rocks of the upper mantle. Therefore, the oldest rocks of the southern uplands are volcanic and sedimentary. They are followed by huge volumes of terrestrial sediments that were carried by rivers and laid down in the shallow sea, and from there were carried by strong underwater currents and laid down on the deep ocean floor. These deposits, called turbidites, now cover most of the southern uplands. The next major rock unit is again the Old Red Sandstone. Only this time it occupies a smaller area and was mostly derived from the erosion of the underlying turbidites. The late Paleozoic deposits are represented by the same succession of sedimentary rocks and coal that characterizes the Midland Valley, but here they mostly appear as isolated outcrops. Now that we very briefly reviewed all the terrains, if we look on the map of Scotland with all the major rock units represented, based on the color gradient, we can make some observations and also some correlations. The conspicuous dark green areas in the Outer Hebrides and part of the extreme northwest mainland represent the oldest rocks in Scotland, the Louisian complex. A much smaller outcrop that is somewhat younger in age but still very old occurs at the western tip of the Isle of Isla, and that is the Rings complex. If we have a closer look at the extreme northwest mainland, 
we can tell that the Toridonian supergroup of the Hebridean terrain is about the same age with the Moin supergroup of the Northern Highlands terrain and also with the Badenoch group of the Grampian terrain. Of the three, the Toridonian was the only one that escaped metamorphism. The other two were severely metamorphosed and deformed during the Noidartian orogeny 800 million years ago and later during the Caledonian orogeny about 400 million years ago. The Dalradian supergroup of the Grampian terrain is slightly younger than the Moin supergroup and also than the Badenoch group on the top of which it rests. The deposition of the Moin supergroup and Badenoch group on the one hand and the Dalradian supergroup on the other hand was separated by the Noidartian orogeny. Therefore, this orogeny deformed only the Moin and the Badenoch, but not the Dalradian. The Caledonian orogeny, which occurred later, metamorphosed and deformed the rocks of all these three units. All these rock units that we've just mentioned, the Louisian and the Rings complexes, the Toridonian and Moin supergroups, the Badenoch group and the Dalradian supergroup, are of Precambrian age. In other words, they are older than 550 million years. The rocks that are between 550 to 250 million years old were deposited throughout the Paleozoic era, which can be divided into the early, middle, and late Paleozoic. Rocks of early Paleozoic age are encountered in the Hebridean terrain, where they were deposited on top of the Toridonian sandstones. Evidence from this time is also encountered in the Midland Valley and Southern Uplands terrains, where it consists of the basement rocks and their immediate sedimentary cover. The Southern Uplands terrain is made almost entirely of rocks of this age. The most notable rock unit of the Middle Paleozoic is the Old Red Sandstone that abounds around the Murray Firth and in the northern and southern Midland Valley. The Old Red Sandstone was deposited as huge volumes of sediments that mostly resulted from the erosion of the Moin and Dalradian rocks that once represented the Caledonian Mountains. Local outcrops of the Old Red Sandstone also occur in the southwest of Scotland and southern uplands. The Late Paleozoic is represented in the Midland Valley and Southern Uplands by sedimentary rocks that very often appear in association with coal. The area covered by these rocks in the Midland Valley is much larger compared to the Southern Uplands. The Mesozoic Era is not significantly represented in the rock record. That's not to mean that there hasn't been any deposition throughout the Mesozoic. It definitely has, but the volume of rocks is almost insignificant compared to the rocks deposited throughout the Precambrian and the Paleozoic. In the Outer Hebrides and the Southern Uplands, the Mesozoic rocks are represented by the New Red Sandstone, which was deposited in desert conditions. The Cenozoic rocks, that is, the rocks deposited in the present era that are younger than 65 million years, are represented on the map by pale yellow and cover extensive areas in the Inner Hebrides and smaller areas in the neighboring mainland. Those are the volcanic rocks of the Hebridean Igneous province that formed during the opening of the North Atlantic Ocean. And now, Although we reviewed most of the rocks in Scotland, we are still looking at an incomplete map. And as you've probably guessed, what is missing are the magmatic intrusions, and there's plenty of them in Scotland. We can briefly divide the magmatic intrusions in four groups. The oldest 
are older than 550 million years, so are generally of Precambrian age and mostly encountered in the Northern Highlands and Grampian terrains. The older granites are included here, and these plutonic rocks were intruded into the pre-existing rocks at the time of the opening of the Iapetus Ocean. The next category of intrusions is the Caledonian, which is by far the dominant, both in number and volume. These intrusions were in place during the closure of the Iapetus Ocean and largely occurred throughout the terrains that were directly affected by the Caledonian orogeny, and in particular throughout the Grampian terrain, against which the volcanic arc of the Midland Valley collided to trigger the formation of this impressive mountain building event. The three large isolated granites that we see in the southern uplands were in place during the last phase of the Caledonian orogeny, called the Acadian. The Variscan intrusions, represented by light red, are somewhat more recent. The Variscan orogeny marked the assemblage of the supercontinent Pangaea at the end of the Paleozoic era. Therefore, the Variscan intrusions were largely emplaced in the same interval in which the late Paleozoic rocks were deposited. And we can clearly see that in the Midland Valley, there is a multitude of rather small Variscan intrusions that are closely associated with the late Paleozoic sedimentary rocks. And the youngest category of magmatic intrusions is related to the opening of the North Atlantic Ocean. These intrusions are mostly not represented on this map, except for a few isolated outcrops on the Isle of Arran. And that's because most of these intrusions either represent central complexes or are very closely associated with them. Therefore, they were included together with the lava fields in the Hebridean Igneous province, which is represented by light yellow. Now that we highlighted the key points discussed throughout the previous sessions and presented some brief conclusions, we can finally say that we reached the end of this course. Please remember that all the information that was presented is essentially a simplification or even an oversimplification of the geology of Scotland, which is incredibly complex. And despite ongoing research, there are still many uncertainties, mostly related to the exact ages of the rocks. However, I hope that at least some of the information sparked your interest and also provided a better understanding of the amazing geology of Scotland. Thank you very much for following this series of presentations and hopefully we will meet again at the next edition of the Festival of Geology.